Don't you just love being behind the scenes on a juicy story? You know what I'm talking about? Some, you know, what's going on with this? What's going on with that? Well, I got a little behind the scenes juicy story for you. My friend Mario Morello comes out of this 12,000 people in Tulsa, boom, meeting, 10,000 night before, boom, goes out to Pasadena, boom, meeting. And then I read this blog. We had 900 pastors at a luncheon up in Bactavia, New York, the stomping grounds of Charles Finney. And there's, they're preparing for a mighty move of God. But something uh, happened. Pastors are, were not in agreement with him, mentioning Trump once or twice in a positive light. How odd is that? And what does that tell you about the nature of the coming move of God? I had to go right to him. I asked him to rearrange his schedule to give you an exclusive personal update about this move of God. And I believe it is a move, not meetings, but a movement and what the future holds. You don't want to miss this one. There is a move of God that's already begun. I have my uh, notes here from listening to Mario Murillo. We were, we had the joy of being able to team up with a big arena that he had rented out for two nights, and we had 10,000 for Flashpoint. And uh, then I was wondering, well, how many will come the second night? We found we had 12,000 for Mario's uh, miracle meeting, I suppose you could call it, evangelism meeting. But the, uh, the altars were packed so much so that we couldn't even get people to the front. And that was the first night. Now, I flew out to Pasadena the next day, and I felt that revival. I haven't felt this in a long time. I felt the momentum of a move of God was on me in Pasadena. And I was kind of like, in a sense, queuing up the daytime session for Mario coming in to minister and um, debriefing with him uh, afterward and saying, I do think the move has begun. And I believe it's, it's a movement that's different than previous movements. And we have, to, we have to analyze that. And then as I'm getting home, getting back in my routine here in Dallas, Texas, and Mario, I'm looking at a blog. Actually, I got a notification from someone who was going to be going to upstate New York. And they said, well, the meeting has been uh, canceled because of some resistance it was run into. So right away, I went to Mario's blog, and I read this fascinating real-life you know, and this is what makes great reality TV, actually. Something's happening right now where there's, there's already pushback and challenges on a move of God. And that just tells me we're right on track. So let me bring Mario Murillo in. And Mario, welcome. Uh, so good to see you again. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that backdrop. You're familiar with mine. We do, we do Flashpoint <laughs> instead of a Fab Four. It's, uh, we'll do a dynamic duo. How's that? Yes, that's it. All that's right. what we are. So um, tell, give us the update on what's happening uh, because so many people are following with great interest now this, what is becoming, I believe, the beginning of a movement. Yes. Uh, right now, uh, Lance, there are 20 cities in America as a direct result of Tulsa, 20 cities that are asking us to come to speedways, stadiums, and arenas, and tent sites. And uh, they say, you need to come. We're ready for you. We've got an army. We've got thousands that want to do it. And uh, one one group that's already buying 5,000 chairs in anticipation. And uh, so it, it's, it's a moment that of extremes. And what happened in New York is it wasn't the resistance that stopped us. It was the silence of those who claimed to be a part of the army. And uh, I'm not even going to uh, attack them or condemn them. I think they were hit by something that maybe they weren't prepared for. We had the most fiery pastor's brunch ever uh, back in April, and it was uh, amazing, their reaction. But there was a strange thing that happened, and it, it's in the volunteers. It's a metric that we use. The streets in Batavia, Buffalo, and Rochester are open to the gospel. Hundreds of people want Christ. Our workers found out that the fish were practically jumping in the boat. That wasn't our issue. Jesus defined the issue when he said, the harvest is great and the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers. And that prayer is a prayer that we prayed vehemently, but here's what happened. 
uh, a group of ministers in that region have a very strange view of Trump and the Democrat Party. They have a strange view of what unity is, of what revival is. And I think that they kind of muzzled the army a little bit. So we ended up with, instead of like we had in Hanford, 1,400 volunteers, we had less than 300. And we were gonna have a tent that could handle over 3,000. And who was gonna pray for them? How many ushers were we gonna have? How were we gonna handle this massive infrastructure? And it became very clear that we were gonna end up in a situation that was really not sustainable. And uh, so, you know, today I wanna deal with the attitude that was there. And I wanna tell you why I feel that God told me to lay the ax to the root, but that essentially is what happened. So just for future cities sakes, because many of us don't understand the mechanics and, and really the engineering of what you do, but you need a certain ratio of workers. And what do these workers do? These volunteers are actually uh, an extension of the ministry team. So what, what, is their, what, are they, what are they doing? Well, we feel that it is important to get into the city, into the stores, the schools, the neighborhoods, go door to door. We're not letting the Jehovah's Witness uh, stop us from what we know will work for the Christians. And uh, the misery, this is what everyone is missing right now, how miserable Americans are. They're absolutely miserable, filled with anxiety and worry, depression and despair. We go to their doors, we offer them food and, and things for their house, and then we pray for them and they're weeping. Everywhere we go, they're weeping. But it's, it's so difficult to explain to a church that I think has been told that this is the way it is. Our church has been 50 members, 100 members for 20 years. They can't fathom that the harvest is that ripe, and it is. And so we did everything in our power. And then I began to weigh the exhaustion of our workers who were out on the streets and looking for the reinforcements that never arrived. And it was a very painful and heartrending decision. Okay, so these workers then are people that are actually going out and evangelizing and kind of like Jesus sent them two by two into every city he was about to go into. You're looking for this army of, of, of individuals and they probably have a function also uh, in the in the meetings themselves. So these are the people that are, uh, when you have an altar call and you have 300 or 500 people, do the, are these volunteers the same ones that are working with the harvest there too? Yeah, and our ratio is th uh, between five to 10 to one now, right now. Even when we have several hundred volunteers, we can have altar calls of 800 to 1200 and they're up there weeping and they want God and they're getting saved. But see, the workers also go out into the neighborhoods. Like I said, we had an incident in Hanford where one of our workers went to a department store to buy some things they needed. And they went up to the checkout counter and they, uh, the lady was, was checking them out. And he looked at her and he said, Jesus loves you. She fell on the counter sobbing. And she was down there for, he said, approximately a minute and a half and couldn't get up off that counter. And, and, and finally she gets up and just says how desperate she was to know God and she needed help for her family. And, and that's the way it is. So we have this everywhere we go. And it's true in Batavia, Rochester, Buffalo. But we did, we, the army didn't show up. It was like, where are you? And it was very devastating, and we know why, because ministers spoke out against us, and, uh, and it, would, it had to do with the fact that I mentioned that I support Trump. And so this became an issue, and they said, you can't do that. Well, it, it, I don't talk about Trump a lot. They do. They talk about him all the time. Found out that the rule was, it isn't that I can't talk about Trump, it's that I can't say anything nice. It's very strange, never encountered it to that degree. But the real problem was the army not showing up. And so if the pastors are the primary vehicle that you're working through, and you had like 900 at a pastor's lunch, we were celebrating that. Uh, but if they, and this is, I hate to say it, but this is the political spirit that exists in the church, that right. the leaders have their own hierarchies of influence and brother right. so-and-so and pastor so-and-so, they've got their network of pastors. 
And if they decide that they're not going to, they don't like the political overtone, they want just revival. And the, in other words, they want John the Baptist to preach uh, forgiveness of sins and repentance, but don't mention Herod and don't mention taxes. Which is, by the way, two sermons. We only have three sermon subjects he talked about and had to do with soldiers being content with wages and about taxes and about Herod. We only have a couple of subjects. And it was all dealing with the affairs of going, what was going on at that time. And they were in response to the questions the people had. So yeah. we're just following the Elijah spirit, which was on John the Baptist, to prepare the way of the Lord. But uh, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they actually didn't approve of the baptism. If you remember, the clergy at that right. time, right. they were like going out to observe it and report on it, but they didn't embrace it. And Jesus set them up that way. He said, was, that, yeah. was, uh, was John the Baptist from heaven or from men? And he right. knew that the clergy had a problem with the move of God. So it's a weird thing in a way. We're doing the right thing. We're going to the, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. We're going to the church first. And I always wondered why it is that you seem, to my mind, obsessed so much with pastors. But I hear you preach and you talk about pastors. And I thought, why is he talking about pastors? It's as though your burden is the pastors are the gatekeepers to the harvest. And they, as you're seeing now in New York, if the pastors aren't in a unity with what God's doing, they actually can close the gate to the harvest, can't they? Yeah, and, and I, was, I was ready to go. I, I'm, a, I'm a fighter. I, I started preaching on the streets. I never quit. Won't back down. If I know God told me to do something, I don't care what opposition I face. This was a clear case of a silence that was induced by a culture. And it's a very strange one because they talk about revival, revival, revival. And I was reminded of the verses in the Bible where Jesus said, you decorate the tombs of the prophets. And, and even acknowledge that it was your ancestors who killed them. And it's almost like the virtue signal saying, we're, we're, we're going to decorate their graves. Well, you talk about Charles Finney up in Western New York, you're going to get a hearing. But I promise you, I knew Charles Finney's teaching. I knew the Presbyterians hated his guts back then. And I know that Charles Finney coming into that region right now would be a lot less friendly than I am. And they would not accept him. They would not. And the funny thing is, they say, we want revival. We're, they use revival terminology all the time, the, the people I'm referencing. But last October 3rd through the 6th, in the rain, 4,000 people came out. They repented of their sins. They were healed in their bodies. They heard messages that were not political, but were entirely focused on healing and salvation. And they didn't accept it. The very thing they were praying for, they saw it with their own eyes, and they didn't accept it. And to the shame of the army, who I love dearly, you shouldn't have listened to them. You shouldn't have let them stop you. You, should, you shouldn't be supporting. You know, there's some, there's some churches in America that claim to be born again. They're taking serious money from the Democratic Party. They're being funded. And so they come into this crisis where, do I go with the word of God and soul winning, or do I stand with what's feeding me and keeping my church doors open? And it's a sad, sad commentary. And so I've never said anything about this. This is like, uh, I'm like the, this is my Rosa Park moment where I've had enough. And I had to, in this one instance, take a stand and say, no, we're not coming. Because you, the army of God, need to stand up and get upset with this and decide that I'm going to support churches that preach the Bible. I'm going to support churches that think, you know, the Democratic Party in New York just passed a law of the most barbaric, heinous law that a child could be born alive from an abortion and laid on a table, still connected with its umbilical cord. And the mother is then asked by the doctor, do you want us to kill it or not? In what society? And yet, one of the things that was said about me is this. The Democrats that were in the audience when you called out the Democrat Party were offended that you were causing division. And I'm sitting there going, you're a Christian and a Democrat? What do they have to do? Now that they have human sacrifice, they're avowed atheists, they're clinically 
connected to the destruction of the American church and you still call yourself a Democrat. And then I'm offensive and causing division. Well, I think there's a movement afoot. We saw it in Tulsa. We're seeing it right now. We're being, they're screaming for us to come to these cities and be saved. And they don't, they, they don't care about that. They don't care about any of that. And I only call it out because it's evil. That's the only reason I call it out. Not because it's Democrat or Republic, but because it's evil. Yeah, and you know, I've been doing a little bit of research on the Tea Party movement, because the Tea Party movement really was a, was a shakeup of the political system that really prepared a populist base for Donald Trump to step into. Right. And I remember Rush Limbaugh saying uh, to his audience, he said, you think that Donald Trump created this movement? He said, you don't understand it. He said, I've been, I've been working with this audience before Trump joined the, the parade, 25 years. He said, it's the movement that found a spokesman that finally they resonated right. with. This is someone who will stick it to the establishment Republicans as well as the dysfunctional Democrats because he's a populist who basically took over the Republican Party. The same way Elon Musk is a free speech billionaire who took over Twitter. Yeah. And so, you know, more power to them when God raises a yeah. Cyrus, wherever they are. I don't care if they're Pentecostal or not. That's where Christians miss it. That guy's being used by God. That's so right. uh, what I see now is the political principality in New York has control over the organized church. Bam. That's the problem. Bam. The political prince has control over the organized church but what will happen out of this, if, if, uh, if we could go there, is I think okay. that when Whitfield yeah. did the New England Awakenings and when Finney did his, uh, his revivals, he created a whole realignment of churches. People miss this. They call them the, the old lights and the new lights. And, this, and what happened was the old school ministry lined up against the revival, but Finney had a number of of uh, pastors that lined up with the revival who squared off with them. And, and we, don't, we don't look at history this way, but he was a reformer of the church. And then he ended up becoming congregational as a congregational ordained because the Presbyterians were so frustrated with him. He went with the Congress, but he never changed his revival or his theology. No, he just never. found an alignment that accommodated the move of God. And I think yeah. that's what we're going to start to see happen. We're, we don't want it to happen. I could see your heart. You were so excited yeah. about 900 pastors. It's almost like you wanted to believe that you would have unity so that they would allow you to have the freedom to John the Baptist a couple of talking points and go with the move of God. But you can't even do that. You've got to be neutered and say what they want you to say for God to do what they want God to do. I don't think you're the yeah. kind of guy that's going to cooperate. No, and there is one uh, thing I want to mention right away, and that is uh, Paul and Lee Doyle, who lead the Cornerstone Church in Batavia. That is a church where the fire of God is falling, and a man of God is in the pulpit saying it like it is. And we are deeply committed to them as a couple and to a growing congregation that has actually increased tenfold since we went there in October. So that's, that's something I want to say. That's a bright light in that situation. And I do believe that God's going to move. You know, there was a Bible college up there that is famous for revival. And one of their leaders uh, invited me to come and speak to the students. But then suddenly there was an undercurrent of wokeism and Trump came up again. And so the president of that college calls me up and says, you can't speak at our college after all because of all the feedback I'm getting. Well, I found out that one of the board members who was the chief individual kind of fomenting me not to be there is a Democrat, spirit-filled Christian who's a Democrat. And so they turn around and then they go, well, you're political. It isn't that they don't want politics. They just want their politics. That's right. what they want. Right. And I suppose we, and I suppose some of this is going to be an educational process because the politician is the top of the pyramid, so to speak. But beneath that are the policies, and beneath yes, that are the uh, platforms that are based on certain principles. And if we were to take the Democratic Party platform and principles, forget about the personalities, 
and just go there and line it up with what uh, Republicans have. And most people miss this. David Barton and, um, and uh, Tony uh, Perkins were, yeah. were two guys that helped shape the platform for yes, 2016 did. for Trump. I never put up, I only wrote one book at that point, and I put the platform in when I found out that two Christians were asked to shape it. And I realized that the substructure of what the party's policies are going to be is based on their plank or their platform. And every Democrat and every Republican who says they follow Jesus should go under the tip of the iceberg to see what's at the root of the tree. Because the root produces the fruit. If you don't like lawlessness, gender dysphoria, if you don't like open borders and a Great Depression, if you don't like international military humiliation, environmentalism, forced vaccination, and surveillance by the government, you might want to go down below the branches to see what Jesus cursed at the root going out of Jerusalem yeah. was manifest in the fruit a day later. We need to go to the root, and the ax is being laid to the root of the tree in this move of God, That's Mario exactly. Murillo, and God's exposing yeah. stuff. And I think the pastors are embarrassed because they haven't been faithful to expose stuff that's coming no, out in this awakening. You know, in every city that we are a part of, there are so many pastors who are on fire for God, and they're willing to lay down their own financial, emotional security for the sake of revival. And, and so I'm a friend of the pastors, but I am deeply, deeply hurt by the fact of the insecurity and the fear mongering and the, the grasping to hold on to control, which is so, uh, it, maybe in a prior era that would be allowable, but we have a nation on the brink and God is rising up. There is a massive movement that has already been born. We saw it in Tulsa. It's spreading everywhere. What God is doing right now in Colorado Springs, where we're going to be there July 10th through the 13th, and on June 4th, we're getting all the leaders from the Colorado uh, Springs area together. But let me tell you something. They're already on fire. They're already uh, chomping at the bit to hit the streets and do the work. That is a, such a clear contrast, and it's an amazing moment. Colorado Springs is going to feel a, a powerful outpouring of the Spirit. Wow. You know, Mario, I have some data from George Barna, and I want to I go back to where you're going next uh, and, and conclude on that note, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be meeting with you and your team, and I really feel like... Yes. We're going to be aligning ourselves, which is why I wanted to put this on my own platform here and let people know what, what we're thinking about. And uh, Barna did research, uh, data research, on what people want to know. Now, I think we ought to include this in our pastor's lunches in the future. Yes. And here's what the survey says of what the congregation wants. They want, this is 74, 84, 94% said, they really do want to understand the theology. They don't want to be told what to believe. They want to understand why they believe it. So they know abortion's bad, but give us the argument of the spirit. What is the, what is the rationale in the Bible, the worldview in the Bible that supports that conclusion? 94%. They want to know about religious liberty, about what to do if it's persecuted, what the boundaries are of, of, of our freedom, and when is civil disobedience justified? Get this. This is 65, 75, 85, 92 percent of the people in the congregation say they wish they heard something about this. Sexual identity, 60 percent, extremely important, 27 percent, very important. That's, uh, that's 6, 7, 8, 87 percent saying it's really important or extremely important that we get this transgender and LGBT argument. What are we actually saying? We don't, we're not angry at people. We don't hate them, but we need to know no. what is the plumb line of revelation on this subject. They, they want to know about the role of government. 46% said it's extremely important. 33% say it's very important. And what I'm saying is the subjects that they're afraid to talk about, you've got 80 to 95% of the people in the pew surveyed said, I wish they would talk about it because I, I just like to know would. what the Bible teaches. 
You know, I want to comment on that. You know that uh, Jordan Peterson was on with Joe Rogan, and there was a, a moment there that nobody could have expected when Jordan Peterson said, uh, I've been reading the Bible. Okay, let, let me comment on that. Anyone watching that is a preacher, that is offended by the word of God, feels it needs to be diluted and that there are off limit subjects and that they have to carefully cherry pick specific easy verses that the modern mind can adjust. That's an insult to the modern mind, by the way. So what happened is Rogan said, what do you think, how important do you think the Bible is? How, do, how important is it as a book? And he looked at Rogan and said, it is not a book, it is the book. And he began in terms of a man that had been run over by a Mack truck to describe the impact that the word of God was having on him. And we've lost sight of the fact. That's why if you listen to me in the tent, it's peppered with verses. I have verses all through my, my sermons because the lost want to hear the verses of the Bible. They want to hear what the Bible says. And shame on anyone that think, that believes this lie, that the modern mind is offended. The evil mind is offended, but not the modern mind. And it is important for us to get back to it. Miracles come when scripture is quoted. When contextual scripture is provided to an audience, it is absolutely shocking what happens to them. And, and I can't believe that we have put our worst foot forward and, and kept on the shelf the greatest weapon that we have, the anointed word of God. And it's uh, my contention as I'm going back, Mario, and reading this, uh, it, didn't, it never occurred to me that John the Baptist comes with the spirit of Elijah. That's Isaiah, you know, Luke chapter 1, it just says, and, and the spirit of Elijah and power of Elijah will rest upon him. And he's anointed to uh, turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And you and Hank and I talk about the attack on children that's mobilizing the pushback yes. across. This is a populist issue. And the church is kind of like, I guess, mingled in there, but it's not necessarily, but I'm telling you, it's the, the moms and dads of America are responding to this, turning the hearts back to their children. And secondly, turning the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, which means that there is a persuasion going on regarding the right, right way of thinking. It's the wisdom of the just. It isn't just salvation, because then when I turned over to John, uh, to Luke chapter 3, the crowds are questioning John the Baptist, saying, what are we supposed to do? The tax collectors want to know, how does this apply to me? The soldiers, these are all, this is what you would say is the populist movement. It's the working class, yes. it's the military yes. people, and it's the populist crowd. And the amazing thing is, John is anointed to preach, get this, he's anointed to, uh, to preach, to turn Israel back to the Lord uh, so that they could, he could preach repentance from sin and forgiveness. I never saw the evangelism anointing working with the Elijah anointing and uh, dealing with the issues of the time, but that's exactly. the move that precedes the coming of Jesus. Yes. Jesus came yeah. right after that. Yeah, and here's, here's the ironic part for me. The idea that a minister would not get in a pulpit and address the evil of his day in whatever form it took. Uh, the man of God, the woman of God gets in the pulpit and says, I don't care what camouflage you're wearing. I don't care how you've rebranded yourself. You, you call it uh, a new normal, and the new normal is nothing but the old abnormal, and I know it, and I'm cutting through it. And go back and watch the, the preaching of Billy Graham. He laid the ax to the root of communism like few men have ever done. His, his vibrant, powerful, fiery gestures with his hands standing there talking about this threat of atheism, and he, there was no holes barred. The idea that a minister wouldn't do that is a new idea. It's not an old idea. It was done by Spurgeon. It was done by Billy Sunday. It was done by John Wesley. They all did it. And we are the first crop of muzzled preachers 
that, that have believed that we don't have a, a right to sit at the table of influence. You know, when you talk about seven mountains of influence, we think of it as, as influence in a way that we, we need to rethink. Look at how Elon Musk has just bought Twitter and the screaming and yelling and, and, and the double standard that is just dying. And it's amazing to me that you look at it, he got that influence not by being nice. He didn't get that influence by being uh, agreeable or creating a palatable approach. And likewise with us, I'm finding that we cannot find room for people to sit in a tent where the truth is unapologetically presented. The people like it because it sets them free. God likes it by demonstrating signs and wonders. It's, it's Acts 14, 3, where it says, and God proved that their message was from him by giving them power to work miracles. So this is an hour of opportunity. I want to say to the army up there, you, you know, in, in Western New York, Mario, you abandoned us. No, I didn't. Hey, Mario, you know, we could have done this. And I sure, I wish I'd have known sooner by your open and, and loud cries. But you still have time, army of God. You still have a chance to speak up and make something happen in your region. Just don't hold back and don't fear the Pharisees. Well, that's a powerful statement. You know, I'm thinking we might be in an Acts, I guess it might be uh, close to like, a, where was it? Chapter 13, where Paul and Barnabas were ministering and the, the, the crowd was in the populist movement. The people were enjoying it. But the uh, rulers of the synagogue that they were really trying to work with spoke evil of what was going on and even blasphemed what was happening. And Paul made an interesting statement. And it's, uh, yeah, it is in Acts 13. The, uh, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. All of Octavia, yes. all of Rochester, they all came out. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was appropriate that the word of God be spoken to you first. But since you're rejecting this and you're judging yourself unworthy of this life, behold, we're going to go to that Gentile over there. And so the Lord's commanded us, I placed you as a light for the Gentiles. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced, glorifying the word of God. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Um, but the Jews incited devout women of providence and leading, prominence and leading men of the city and instigated a persecution to drive them out of their territory. And mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas shook off their feet in the protest and were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit and went to the next city. I think the biblical pattern Beautiful. we're looking at is as ancient as the Old Testament and the New Testament combined. It's the, the Lord comes in, it, it produces a moment of decision based on alignment. And if you're, if, you're, if you're not in alignment with what God's doing, you actually oppose it and uh, you end up rejecting yourself from participating. And God says, I went to you, now I'm going to, the harvest is still there. It's just, yep. you're not going to be the ones that are going to be no. hauling in the fish. Right. And they went ahead, and of course, there's still going to be persecution, but it's, uh, and it's going to be raised up, uh, I think, out of the devout women of prominence and leading men. So it's like the elites. You'll see the media and a business guy and a leading pulpit, and they'll come out and they'll do a special on you, exposing you, and you're this, you're that. And, but nevertheless, God's got his harvest. The workers are left there to go work it, and you go to the next city. This could very well be the pattern of New Testament breakthrough in America. Yep. You know, and I want to add something uh, to this. I don't know how much time I've got left. I don't know. Every day to me is a gift. And every day I have to make a painful decision. How can I do the most good in the least amount of time? And, and you and I both know that people write us and email us and invite us to things, and, and you get the feeling from their side that we have all the time in the world. Come and do our conference because you got time to do this. Come and go over here and do this for us. You got plenty of time. We don't. 
And we have to choose our moves exceedingly carefully with surgical accuracy. I gotta know where I belong, where I should be preaching. And right now, I, can, I haven't got one iota of time to persuade a reluctant army. I've got to go where they're ready and the harvest is ripe and the workers are available. Yeah, and that reminds me of the Finney in his book of revival lectures. He had a chapter called The Necessity of Effect and Union. He said the two things that he needed, he had invitations um, as you do, and he said the two things he looked for was evidence of the spirit of prayer, which in that period of time really was a revival. There was a, there was a spirit of prayer. I think you know what that's like, and I do. Yes. But there's an atmosphere where people are, there's a contagion of yearning, wrestling, expectation, and kind of an agonizing fervency for something to happen. And he sent his teams ahead to scout out like spies to see, is the spirit of prayer there? or do we have to bring it with us? And secondly, how united are the clergy for what this really is? Do they understand what they're yeah. asking for? Yeah. And if they could see that the clergy were united for what God was sending, and the people were in prayer, and the atmosphere right. was sufficiently, had the voltage, then Finney took that as two signs that it goes to the next level of where do we go and how do we schedule? And I think you said something to me about Billy Graham. Wasn't it a Greta Van Susteren or an interview that he said there were mm -hmm. two things he would do differently? Let's share that with the audience before we close out because that yeah. had an impact on me and I came home and shared it with the team. Okay, the first thing that Billy Graham said is that if I had it to do over, he's 94 when he said this, he said, I would have studied more. Uh, and I feel that preparation is the, the key. I have to be prepared. And he, he said, I would have studied more. And then the second thing he said, I would have done less conferences, hardly any conferences, and I would have done all crusades. I would have added more crusades. And I truly feel that. You know, to add, to speak to Finney's, and just one quick comment. I think that there is a deception between the word unity and agreement. We look at the word unity, and that, that word is thrown a lot around in the state of New York among ministers, unity, unity, unity. But what they don't understand is what they're saying is, let's reduce our distinctives to the degree where we are not ever rocking the boat. Agreement is different. Agreement is born out of urgency, saying, you know what, our differences is not, are not nearly as important as the threat. And when Peter prayed for signs and wonders, he said, behold the threat. So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, whatever we don't agree with is really unimportant if you look at what we do agree. We do agree that America is going under. We do agree that our children are threatened. So until you as a minister look me in the eye and reflect that urgency, I'm not sure I wanna work with you because you've learned to live with a dulled sense of social conscience and urgency. And it's, it's shown in your deliberate actions to maintain a system or a methodology that isn't working. I'm ready for war. I'm ready to confront the enemy. And I really believe that urgency is what, what causes the spirit of prayer and what causes a cohesive and with, with unity, you get a, a coffee clatch with ministers talking friendly to each other. With agreement, you get people joining forces against a common enemy, and that's what we need. I love that. So if we were to update this for our era, we'd say that we're not looking for unity, we're looking for agreement. Do you know what we preach? Do you know what we believe? Do you know where we draw the line? Because Finney drew the line even up, he, was, he started the abolitionist movement and then clipped it because he said, you gotta be careful. Here's a weird thing. Don't get so carried away with the fervor of the subject that you're messing up my revival. So then there's the balance for you and me too, right. which is I do want you, you know, 100% invested in the abolitionist movement to save America. But I don't want you stumbling over the move of God and messing it up because of your because of your zeal for the political battle. So we know we know where that line is. The other thing yes, is, we the, do. and the other thing is the spirit of prayer. 
is really the, the urgency. I think that's, that, that's the, I picked that up from you. It's agreement where unity was with, with uh, Finney. It's urgency where the spirit of prayer was. Because if you have urgency, you've got the appropriate disposition of prayer. It's that yes. we must have this now. And, and to your point, I mean, I'm looking at invitations I've gotten, and I, you know, it's, uh, which is why I want to meet with you and talk about what God is saying, because I don't want to fill the calendar with men's retreats and pastor's retreats no. and, and, and some of my favorite churches doing a special conference. I mean, I would like to, I just felt the, I felt the conviction when you said that, that something different is happening and nobody's doing it, Mario. I mean, what really has to happen is, I mean, I'll take the responsibility for this part, but when we have 2,000 people saved, I not only want to see them filled with the Holy Ghost and planted in the right church, I actually want to recruit them for the school reformation, for the reformation in the communities. I'm a reformer. I want to see right. revival lead to reformation so it isn't just a, um, wasn't that great while the government shuts us down. I want to be able to push back on the government shutting us down. And so that's going to require the mobilization of the masses. So You know, I want to, I want to say one thing about a young lady that was in our tent in Hanford, because I want people to understand what's going on. She came in dressed as a man in a lesbian relationship. She might have been 20 years old, totally dressed like a man. And when she came into that tent, the power of God and the love of God began to break down her defenses until she experienced a finny revival type conversion, conviction, broken, uh, cleansed and delivered, went through a deliverance. She immediately joined our team to work the streets. It wasn't like, okay, now you go home and start, get some follow-up. She was activated instantly. I didn't see her for several months, but when I did, she, she was a, a, just a charming young lady. Long hair, everything soft and, and, and transformative about her. That's what we're talking about right there. That's what this is all about. I love it. Mario, how can people stay in touch with you and get in touch with you and know where you're going next, where, where I'm probably going to end up going next when you go there? So where is that? <laughs> it's uh, Colorado Springs on July 10th through the 13th. And they can go to mariomarillo.org and be connected to everything we're doing right now.